Good day, this is Paul Benjamin Lowry, and this is part two of the video lecture series where I'm talking about connecting an interdisciplinary research discourse to artifacts of theory. In the second part, I'm going to finish the discussion and examples of artifacts of theory so we can put all these pieces together and best understand how we can generate more creative, more powerful theory and in interdisciplinary research. So if you recall last time we were in the middle of discussing metaphors and I cut the video slide series there because metaphors are exceptionally important to good creative theorizing and I want, wanted you to contemplate that. And, and I ended last time with the metaphor of the double helix from Watson and Crick. So the double helix, of course, as this model that um, represented the overall theory they were trying to explain led to the essentially the discovery of, of molecular biology and changed the world for good. So really being able to visualize things and see them metaphorically and, and to put them in to model form is, is very powerful. And there's a lot of ways to look at metaphors, but a key thing that we need to keep in mind is to really be mindful of the context of these metaphors for the discourse we're engaging in. Now here I would caution, we have to be extra careful how we use our metaphors. We need to think about the context of how we metaphorize and the discourse so that it actually makes sense. One of the problems I see all the time and interdisciplinary research is the use of metaphor that's inappropriate or misleading or confusing. So let's just think of an example. Think of metaphors for love. So if I show you this photo, you're thinking radiant sunlight and, and uh, dewy fields of grass and a gentle breeze or something like that perhaps as a metaphor for love, but the metaphor could actually really change dramatically depending on the discourse that you're in. So for example, if you're talking about humanitarian service and let's talk about the context, specific context of Mother Teresa or people like her, Mother Teresa actually gave a metaphor for love and her metaphor was love is a fruit in season at all times and within the reach of every hand. Well, this is a very different metaphor for love than what I introduced with the kissing couple. So you can see how mixing metaphors or putting the wrong metaphor in the wrong context can actually make communication difficult. But if you match the metaphor of the context, it conveys meaning quickly. So just having a little fun with this, um, Charles Bukowski, a little bit on the cynical side, um, what his metaphor for love was that love is a dog from hell. Very different metaphor, different meaning. Now let's get a poet's perspective. Let's suppose we're entering the discourse of poetry. Um, here we have Pablo Neruda. And so naturally the way he would metaphorize love would have a poetic touch to it. And in fact, that is the case. The way he described love is that quote, love is a journey with water and stars with drowning air and storms of flower. Okay, I'm not sure what he meant about storms of flower, but it does seem to be quite poetic. Finally, a, a final fun example of love metaphors is 
Ivan um, Turgenev, he said, love is a disease and disease knows no laws. So there we have it, five simple examples of vastly different metaphors of love for five different discourses on love. If you use them aptly and appropriately, your audience shares understanding and finds an elegance in what you have to say. But obviously, if you mix these metaphors with the audience, it can be exceedingly confusing. So as we turn away from metaphors, here's another example. Perhaps you are thinking love in terms of a relationship with your, your favorite animal, your favorite dog. Another example of this kind of love. So in this kind of discourse, we're talking about an unconditional love, a happiness, this joy of, of taking care of a creature that's vulnerable and, and is dependent on you and loves you back unconditionally as dogs do. Now, finally, this section on metaphors for love would not be complete without the gratuitous cute kitten photo. Who does not love a cute kitten on the keyboard? What better form of love could we find? Okay, so moving on, I put analogies by metaphors, by myths, just because these all are a little more related than the others. Now, metaphors and analogies are probably the artifacts of theory that are most related. And personally, I don't like to spend a lot of time distinguishing between these, but formally, of course, analogies are in that same spirit of the metaphor, but we often use these more so for logical argumentation and piecing together our theory. So we'll use these often for as a sophisticated form of contrast or comparison. So a comparison between two things is an analogy, and this is typically done for the purpose of explanation or clarification. Well, naturally then, theory, theorizing is replete with analogy because good theory is trying to explain, trying to com compare things, trying to clarify. So this is also something just very fundamental in theory as is metaphor. Now, Real quickly, some other definitions of analogies. Um, another one would be a correspondence or partial similarity. And finally, in terms of analogizing, in terms of theory building, analogizing would be a process of arguing from similarity in known respects to similarity in other respects. This is a great foundational argumentation skill that helps convey understanding and helps persuade your audience of your theoretical claims. So good theory is replete with analogy as a structural mechanism. Good theory has metaphors that are aptly used that are appropriate to the context. And just a real quick depiction of this, of analogy versus metaphor. I've also thrown in simile, which is a little more simple and more of a writing device. So the use of words of like and as, he's as hungry as a horse. So here's a Venn diagram that shows how they overlap. Now, the thing that similes, analogies, and metaphors almost always share is that they compare two things. So similes and metaphors, however, are figures of speech, um, types of analogies. And anyway, you can look at these and, and use them um, very aptly, especially analogy and metaphor. I wouldn't get too caught up on what you call them, especially comparing between 
simile and analogy. Okay, so the next artifact of theory is what we call the paradigm. Paradigm is one of these artifacts like models that can be quite confusing. And so it's really important that you be clear what you mean when you use the artifact paradigm. First of all, in written and spoken in English language, often paradigm and model are used interchangeably. And we definitely don't want to do that in theory building or in science because they don't have interchangeable meanings when we're theorizing. So really, there's only one thing that we really mean when we talk about a paradigm. And so think of it as your frame of reference or the lens by which you see things. So it's your worldview or the worldview underlying the theories and even the methodology of particular subjects or discourses. So um, your epistemology could be part of your paradigm. So maybe someone sees him or herself, his or her worldview as a post-positivist or as a critical interpretivist or as a critical realist or as a positivist or whatever. That could be part of your paradigm, but also um, perhaps uh, the paradigm of the discourse that you're entering. Now, I'm not a huge fan of overemphasizing the paradigm in discourses because I think that's something that should not hold you back from making a contribution. So you often have discourses that, that tend to lean a certain way that, for example, um, tend to use interpretive data or tend to use um, scraped empirical data. Well, sure, that might be the paradigm and maybe um, a discourse is post-positivist, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be applying other epistemologies, other methodological approaches or philosophies um, to the area. So that's where I think we need to be very careful to not constrain ourselves according to a given paradigm. Okay, just to emphasize this last point so you don't forget. Hello, my name is Paradigm. I am not a model. Paradigm and model are not interchangeable. Okay, for the next artifact of theory, I introduce hypotheses or a hypothesis. Now, this is an, an artifact around which many young academics and PhD students develop a lot of confusion because of the way their statistics or me methodology courses are taught. Um, there can be quite a bit of sloppy thinking here your hypotheses or your hypothesis, this is not a theory. This is an operationalized, testable statement of a portion of your theory or a por of the proposition or, or statements of your theory about constructs. So hypotheses are very operational and it's connecting theory to method. Now, importantly, uh, here, you don't want to confuse model with hypotheses. Often students think, OK, well, a model is just a collection of hypotheses. That is not correct. A model can rep is an analogy or metaphor that can represent all kinds of things. So sure, it can, t can contain a collection of hypotheses, but it can also contain um, propositions. Or it can be a, a topology of concepts or constructs, or it can show, illustrate myths or metaphors. So models and hypotheses really 
have no special connection. All right, so just going to study.com, this is basically back to high school science or high school chemistry, what the purpose is of a hypothesis. It's to explain what you expect to happen, to be clear and understandable, to be testable, to be measurable, to contain typically an independent, independent variable. Now, of course, you could hi also hypothesize around a moderator or a mediation effect and you can hypothesize around the shape of a relationship. It doesn't have to be linear. It could be an inverse U or, or, or something like that. But and again, this is kind of how we tend to be taught around hypotheses, and then we confuse it with theory itself. It is not theory, and it's not a full explanation. It is very partial. Okay, so now that we have that clear, time for a little bit of humor. All right, so if you have two scientists, one is proposing to the other scientist, will you marry me? He says, she says, I reject the null hypothesis. Now remember, null hypothesis means no change. To interpret this, this is saying, I reject the status quo, so there is now a change in our status to be engaged to be married. And the male scientist is happy. Yes, reject means yes, because no hypothesis means no change. So be careful with this logic, however, in real world relationships outside of science. Okay, this leads us to the next artifact of theory, which we call a statement in our JIT paper. A statement is somewhat abstract. This is basically um, formally a mode of existence proper to a group of signs that describe a definite position for any subject. So it's taking a stand, making a tie, making a claim. Now that generally tends to be a little too abstract. So the artifact you're more likely to use that I see is a little more pragmatic and interchangeable here is the idea of a proposition. A proposition is a form of statement, but it's a specific kind of statement. They're different from hypotheses, importantly. They often take the same kind of form, but instead of variables you're talking about that are operationalized from constructs, these um, are dealing with constructs. So an independent construct that's or two or whatever that are used to explain a dependent construct. Now, propositions, these richer statements are, are much more theoretical than our hypotheses. In fact, they tend to be much richer in their setup in explaining the, the causal mechanisms and the boundary conditions and the assumptions. And so a given propositional statement alone can kind of be seen like a mini theory. It can be the standalone theoretical claim that has many implications. So, uh, and of course there's different kinds of statements uh, leading different kinds of propositions but the classic theoretical explanation um, would involve the need to provide a, a clear logical story in a case for why two constructs are related, how they are related, what kinds of things cause their relationship to change over time, um, some of the logic, the facts, the axioms, the foundation for making that so. So the propositional statement sure might seem somewhat like a hypothesis, usually written in a more uh, contextually rich form, but it's all the material and the support behind the proposition that makes it so much different from the hypothesis, because this is your theory.
and these connections of interrelated propositions along with the constructs and the questions and the myths and all these things, this um, adds up to your overall theory. Now, importantly, good propositions, good claims and statements for interdisciplinary research really follows what Merton talked about in terms of middle range theorizing. Not to be confused with mid range or arid theorizing, but this middle range. Middle range is ideal for interdisciplinary research. And here, the, the theory is not grand theory, but it's in the middle, but, but is richly contextualized. So this is important because that means a good proposition that we create in interdisciplinary fields must be rich with context. So more context is better, not less, because we're trying to tell an interesting, vivid story in um, building up our propositions. Now, the other key part of a proposition is its foundation, all of its foundation is in argumentation. In fact, this is why we're called PhDs. Recall the PhD stands for a doctorate in philosophy. So all original scientists were deeply embedded in philosophy because philosophy might be the strongest discipline in terms of argumentation and logic. And unfortunately, many of our fields have lost these philosophical roots. So we've lost this art of argumentation. So one of the, the most important things, especially for more technology and business um, and sociotechnical researchers, you need to get back into disciplined logic and argumentation that comes from philosophy. So here, as we build up good propositions, it's all about good argumentation. Our claims or our statements or propositions, the evidence for those claims or propositions, and the reasoning. Now, what do you know? How do you know that? Why does your evidence support your claim? Now, the key trap here with emerging scholars is to use results of previous studies as the evidence. Whereas, sure, it is true that results point to potential evidence, what you want to do is really break down how that evidence, the result, and what was behind it in that study, how that ties to yours. Now, some of the great Nobel Prize winners are phenomenal at doing this kind of thing. And it's, it's a great path toward better research and theorizing. And the idea here is you don't take an outcome as the claim or the evidence. You need to look at the paper and you need to see, well, what was their claim evidence and reasoning? Are there fallacies? Oh, are there artifacts of theory? Have they introduced a myth? Have they introduced a paradox, a conundrum? You'll find, surprisingly, even in our top journals, that there are often hidden assumptions, fallacies, false logic, myths that you can more systematically build on to um, develop your propositions. Now, um, when you do this, your papers read much more interestingly than papers that say so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that. That's the worst way to reason through. That's not reasoning. That's just rattling off findings 
that you are not objectively critically looking at. So the painful part of this, what this means is really as you engage in a discourse, it's not that you should be distrusting, but you need to go and read all of the papers that you cite as foundational for your claims and really understand what's going on so you can tease apart claims, evidence, and reasoning to find interesting gaps and interesting opportunities that you can better logically address. And this is something the great scientists do over and over. Now, along these lines, another way to look at this proposition as a mini theory, you introduce your argument, you state your thesis or your proposition, you anticipate active opposition. What are the, the counter arguments? What, are the, what will those be? And you develop your argument in light of those counter arguments. And then you figure out your, the organization around it and write a conclusion. So this is also good thesis writing. So as many of you know, I'm a big fan of Andy Vanavan from University of Illinois, great interdisciplinary researcher who really put forth engaged scholarship with critical realism and has made wonderful contributions by doing so. And one of the people that Andy Vanavan is a fan of, and thus I am a fan of, is Toolman. And um, also many philosophers are fans of Toolman in that he set up a pretty systematic, logical, pragmatic, clear way to argue things. So this is probably one of the, the most straightforward tools or frameworks to follow for good statements, good propositions that are, are well argued. So Toolman talks in terms of claims and grounds, warrants, qualifiers, rebuttals, and backings. So in his method, and of course I recommend his work very highly, every argument begins with three fundamental parts. Every argument, you have the claim, the grounds, and the warrant. Now, this obviously is starting to remind you of your high school debate team, and um, as it should, because this is good debate, logical argument structure that we should ideally use when we're writing theoretical propositions. So just as an example here in this figure, grounds. The claim, of course, we start with the claim, there are dogs um, nearby. The grounds, you hear a barking and howling in the distance. The warrant, dogs are animals that bark and howl. Okay, so then what do we have as backing? You know that your neighbor Tom has two large German shepherds and perhaps they're known to bark qualifier so the chances are so there's a high likelihood now qualifiers are really important in science where we show a little bit of modesty or being conservative about these claims so we're not saying oh it's definitely a dog there's no question look at my evidence it's there's a high likelihood in this circumstance that there are dogs nearby when you hear barking and howling in the distance. Now, you need to think of the rebuttals though of, well, what if it's an area that has coyotes or there's wolves, or maybe there's teenagers that like to drive around making barking noises. So you need to look at the other potential situations that you may need to logically rebut. So poor theorizing, poor propositions only give the backing, right? And so they make big claims and, and they have the backing and grounds, but they don't look at qualifying these claims and they don't look at the counter evidence. 
again, this is where good discourse thinking can really help you because you lose credibility when you only show one side of the argument. So the last thing you want to do is in supporting a proposition is only review papers that show the same direction. Now, first of all, that's not very interesting because if it's already been shown, then why are you proposing it? Propositions should generally be original. Now, we can do so, of course, by putting it in a context or in a situation we haven't seen before, but only showing positive evidence is really kind of a feeble approach because we can find really interesting theoretical opportunities and qualifiers and things that need to be rebutted based on counter arguments and counter evidence in the literature. Okay, this brings us to another artifact that can be somewhat problematic for interdisciplinary research that's socio-technical or in sciences of the artificial, and that is the artifact of law. Now, here's, here's the issue. A law is a generalization that applies across space and time and provides a framework for events that we use to plot or understand phenomena that need an explanation. It serves as a starting point from which we survey events looking for anomalies, however they may be construed. Now, the problem is we're not in the natural sciences the nat or mathematics. These are replete with laws. These are things that can be counted upon, such as gravity or, or a proof, a mathematical proof that we can literally prove. Whereas in our disciplines, we don't prove anything. We only show potential support for our propositions. We never prove our propositions. So this is very problematic to overdo law-like thinking in sciences of artificial. Because essentially, when you think about it, almost everything we deal with in our fields is made up. So people make up processes and technologies and organizations. They form culture. They form societies. And so there aren't laws that consistently govern these because they're artificial. So there's not a bounding by law. Now, this is a good reason why we don't do grand theories in our fields. Grand theories make sense for sciences that are built on law, because then you can build up a very large theory or taxonomy that explains things grandly across uh, phenomena, across various um, sub-disciplines. We, we don't do that. So instead, what you want to do is we can still practice the use of law-like statements, but make sure they are qualified so they're not confused with a law-like claim. Now, the other thing, we can look at laws or um, things that are treated as law, which can cross over with myth, and we can use this to better understand problems that need further solutions. So, for example, there's Moore's Law. Well, this was the whole idea of computing capacity. This isn't a law, and it's already been disproven. So there are quite a few things like this in industry or in practice where it's treated as a law, but it really isn't a law. And these can be things that we can further address. So often when we think of law as well, we think of the skills of justice. We think of legal institutions. Now, this is definitely not what we mean in our disciplines because legal institutions, these are artificial. There's nothing 
natural in terms of law about the legal discipline. It's completely made up. There's nothing repeatable or predictable about it. So definitely do not confuse justice and, and the legal system laws with what we're talking about here. So we have natural sciences and mathematics that are replete with law. So we know there's this the laws of motion or the laws of inertia. There's mathematical proofs. There's, there's formulas that we can count on. Now, we don't need to divorce ourselves from this. And in fact, some of this can be very helpful and we can infuse into sciences the artificial as long as we know what is truly law and what is not. So here, again, as we go into practice, it's good to ask ourselves, is there an intersection with natural law or is this essentially completely made up and is used as a framework? So Moore's law is completely made up. It's used as a framework. It, it no longer holds as it has. It was useful for a while for prediction, but now it doesn't predict computing power increases because we've hit physical limits. Now, conversely, let's look at some highly inter disciplinary areas that you might be involved in. So sustainability as an example, or autonomous cars. Now, being aware of the potential for intersection with natural sciences actually is quite important and it can inform what you're doing even though you are not working in the natural science. So sustainability uh, for example, you might be interested in the socio-technical aspects and, and you want to look at, well, how do I motivate or change organizations to be more sustainable, perhaps through web dynamics or platform computing or something like that. But it is useful to be aware of in this kind of discussion, this is an interdisciplinary area that also crosses natural sciences because there's climate science involved, there's chemistry, there's physics, there's mutation and natural selection. And in fact, evolution, natural selection, mutation, this is so established that it's treated as law-like because it is so uh, predictable and repeatable. Now, autonomous cars, well, what, what are some natural law considerations there? Sure, a lot of it is engineering and socio-technical. Uh, maybe, maybe you're interested in the massive privacy implications, privacy concerns with autonomous vehicles, because we're sharing all this information with the government and with cl uh, cars around us. But there's some important natural laws involved, um, such as, of course, physics, various laws of physics, because we're dealing with moving devices and devices that are um, of high momentum of, of weight. And, and so then you have um, issues with accidents. Um, you can even um, be dealing with the laws of thermodynamics and the, these define um, physical qu quantities such as temperature, energy, entropy. So even though you might be only interested in privacy implications of autonomous vehicles, you could find some interesting inspiration from other discourses that are entering into this and even from the natural sciences. Certainly, if you're trying to make policy recommendations, you need to be aware of these other discourses and it, it creates for some really interesting and complex work in these kinds of areas. Very being studied and this consists of the concepts, the constructs, the related statements. Um, it also involves the assumptions, the expectations, the beliefs, the theories, the mechanisms. So really it's the whole work. So it's beyond um, a model and even beyond 
a paradigm because it's basically everything but the kitchen sink. So for example, when Crick and Watson discovered the structure of DNA, their framework consisted of what they knew, including the history of what researchers knew about DNA, including um, Schrodinger's theory about genes, related work on X-ray crystallography, um, Linus Pauling's atomic models. So frameworks envelop theories and models and concepts and statements, expectations and beliefs. So this, this is your, your framework, a researcher's map of the territory. So this is a nice way to look about working into a specific interdisciplinary discourse is to actually map it out. Now, this is just a, a nice visual a map, census map, that provides a visualization of mapping, of how powerful it can be. And we rarely do this with frameworks, is to actually visualize it and lay it all out. But this kind of thinking can be very helpful, especially as we're going into new territory and to show others where we're going, why we're going there, and how it relates to the rest of this framework. So finally, this brings up the last key artifact of theory, and that's model. And you can see why I waited a while to talk about this, because I started this presentation by making a point that a model is not synonymous with theory. And and I made the later points that models and paradigms are not the same. Models and frameworks are not the same. And so as we work through this, it goes back to my other point as well that a model isn't just a device that we hang hypotheses on. So sure, we could have a visual model of our hypotheses, but we can visualize, we can model basically any artifact of theory. And we can use these models, these models are metaphors or analogies to make representations that simplify to compare things, to contrast things. So this is where design thinking can be very helpful to sure maybe visualize your hypotheses, if that makes sense in a model, but try to visualize these other components, try to model them so you're thinking more broadly of how to communicate. So here we can learn quite a bit from the natural sciences. They have always used models that apply to the discourse or context they're delving into, and they're not constrained with this idea oh, you have to use box arrow diagrams around hypotheses. They think more broadly. So this, for example, would be a model of the Earth's crust. Other kinds of models would include mathematical modeling or mathematical models. The, these are um, another form of, of modeling. So outside of mathematical modeling in natural sciences or dis interdisciplinary research, models are these imperfect copies of the phenomena of interest that we're trying to study or explain. And they naturally consist of analogies. So for example, early models of heredity and biology suggested that children inherit a mixture of traits. And this would be the mixture model. Models are also analogs. So these analogies within models are really important as it creates this imperfect copy of the phenomena of the interest or the, what we're trying to explain in the context we're trying to explain it. And it can consist of positive and neutral analogies. So William Gilbert, for example, was a a physician who 
applied a model of the Earth as a magnet to explain why compasses point north, which was his theory. So models don't subsume our theory at all, but they can simplify and explain and depict and analogize parts of our theory. But never does it fully contain the why, the explanation, the assumptions, the boundary conditions, and, and so on and so forth, which envelops the overall theory that we're trying to build. So here is a typological model of models. And this is a nice way to look at this. So we have abstract models and we have physical models. So in the natural sciences, they long have used physical models that are scale models or analog models. Um, on the abstract side, you really have two directions of abstraction. One is mathematical, the other one is conceptual. Now, most of us in interdisciplinary research that involves sciences of artificial, we're on that conceptual side. So we might get in occasionally into um, empirical mathematical models, analytical models, or numerical models, but those are really different. Those are more mathematics or engineering in approach and what we tend to do in our modeling is creating conceptual models because we are dealing with concepts and constructs and trying to show relationships between them. The idea here for us is to try to apply more design thinking, to not be constrained with the kinds of visuals we create, but to create ones that communicate, that are inherently um, analogies with positive and neutral analogies and that convey understanding as part of our theorizing. So get beyond box arrow diagrams and think of depicting what you're trying to explain, what you're trying to predict. Here's a really great um, concept diagram of climate modeling that W.F. Ruderman uh, produced. And it's a beautiful model that explains quite well. It's not the complete theory around climate change or climate modeling, but it shows this key part of how these parts work. All right, so back to the, the dreaded box arrow diagrams. And this example is actually from uh, one of my papers. And it's actually a paper I'm quite proud of. And in the next video series around artifacts of theory, I'll actually talk about this in the broader context, because this is from a gamification study that was very oriented toward design thinking and very much oriented toward artifacts of thinking. And this is part of it. In, in this case, with box arrow diagrams that show how the hypotheses come together. But it's really not as interesting as, and inspiring as these other models that I've showed you. And so it's typically a key part of empirical research to show especially if we're doing any kind of path modeling or structural equation modeling to show these kinds of relationships, but it's not sufficient. So we need other depictions of our artifacts. And in the next video series, I'll, I'll show how we made this a lot more interesting than this fairly typical, um, fairly staid box arrow diagram. Okay, so we've gone through these major artifacts of theory. So we have the question, concept, construct, myth, metaphor, analogy, paradigm, hypothesis, statement, law, framework, model. So is this all together our theory if we put all of this in, in one blob? And the answer to that would be no, especially if we are putting it together in a blobular 
format. So what's missing here? What's connecting all of this? Well, we still haven't talked about the context and the assumptions and the boundary conditions and the underlying causal mechanisms and some of the axiomatic thinking or things that are held to be true such that you don't have to give strong support for it, but building up the argumentation, right? So we don't have these details there that string all this together. Yeah, so the key task is Yes, these are the key artifacts of theory that you build in your context for the interdisciplinary course you're engaging in around thoughtful phenomena of interest. They're tied to problems that you're raising questions about, right? But we connect it by our argumentation, our writing, and, and we need to put in our assumptions and boundary conditions and when this will work, when it won't work, and why. And this all becomes about storytelling. This is about good writing. So the best theorists, the best scientists, tend to be great storytellers because it's the story that makes sense. So certainly, Tolman's argumentation is foundational. You have to have great structure and logic and argumentation to pull these pieces together. But if it is an arid state, painful exposition, people aren't going to want to read it. We must tell a convincing, interesting story. There needs to be tension. There needs to be elements of surprise, of solving something that we weren't quite sure could be solved. And the solution isn't exactly necessarily what we would expect, for example. So storytelling is pivotal to high quality theorization. So again, our boundary conditions. So we got to tell a good story, but we also need to know what the bounds are when the theory, the propositions you're creating, when they apply and when they don't, and what the scope is and, and situations or contexts in which it shouldn't work. And this is really important to middle range theorizing. You shouldn't be theorizing in a grand manner such that the proposition should hold in all circumstances because that doesn't make sense in the phenomena, this context that we deal with, because so much of it is artificial and made up. So that's why we really have to bound what we're doing quite tightly and really dig into layers of context. And the interesting thing is the more we dig down, it actually creates a better story is what's interesting. Um, the meta, the broader uh, stories, the grand stories, well, for one, it takes a book to write a grand theory. And so it's a, a, at a different level. Now, this series isn't going to go very deeply in how to evaluate the quality of theory, but I, I will leave you with a few ideas here. And one of them is there is an art to good theory and good theory building. There should be something unusual and striking and, and beautiful about, about a good theory that grabs your attention. Another good indicator of a good theory overall is a theory that is well done is parsimonious or it's stingy. It's very tight in the constructs that it uses and the relationships and the explanation. It has an elegance. So here we talk about not just being stingy, but about Oakham's razor. So explaining things in the most simple form possible. That's because theory fundamentally is about analogies and metaphors and and 
making simplifications of reality. So we don't want reality in its full detail. And that's really important uh, consideration. So a theory um, is very succinctly um, told. So a theory can be parsimonious or stingy and well told, but simple is not good enough because the, conversely, sometimes a theory and its associated claims might be simple and straightforward, but are kind of odd and not very useful as this um, photo depicts. There's something very off with what's going on here. And so are we grounded in reality and actually dealing with something, solving a problem that needs to be solved? Or are we just creating a solution up? So in that regard, we can be too creative. We can take our creativity too far. So is the bicycle a problem that needs to be solved? And while this is a very creative solution to replace the wheel with spokes of shoes, and that would certainly take a lot of impressive effort to do something like this, what about the utility of this? This has no utility. This is a lot of effort. It's kind of cool, and it's useless. So the utility of theory, and does it actually improve on existing theories. So the theory of the bicycle, the theory of the wheel, is it better than that? In this case, I would quite reasonably argue that this is not an improvement. People don't want to be having to replace multiple running shoes for the device, the conveyance they use to get to work. Not to mention, this does not look like a very smooth ride. So another fun example of lack of utility, here there's a beauty, there might be an elegance of symmetry about this solution or this model, but again, what's the utility of this? And is this something people would actually use? Does it improve upon eyeglasses or does it improve upon protective eyewear? What's the purpose of this? Is this simply to gain attention? So is it a grand, exciting uh, theory full of extra stuff, but in the end, existing simpler theories and their associated models are more useful? And then you have theories. Sure, there's a simplicity, there's a parsimony, but in the end, it's simply ridiculous because it's solving a problem that doesn't need to be solved. It's doing so in a way that isn't grounded in reality. And this is really important for interdisciplinary areas to be grounded in practice. What is it a completely made up ridiculous solution? So turning from bad theory this is good theory. There's something about good theory when you see it. It's striking, it's motivating, it's balanced. There's a symmetry to it, there's a beauty, there's, it's elegant, it's parsimonious. You understand it, it works well. The parts that are there should, that are used serve particular purposes that you recognize. Further details. And I'll cover that in a few future series where I go into more depth on how to evaluate the quality. All right, we already talked about Watson and Crick and the beauty, beauty and elegance of the model of the double helix, which informed the greater theorizing that they were doing that led to the field of molecular biology. Such a beautiful example. So just as a reminder, their model of the double helix does not represent their entire theory. It is simply an elegant 
artifact of their theory that helped simplify it. It's so it was a form of metaphorizing which connected to this broader discourse. So storytelling is your most powerful tool again. And in fact, I really have enjoyed reading stories of how great theorizing happens, such as Watson and Crick's discovery. You'll find a lot of inspiration as you go through these stories. And you, you also realize how much that good science is not a waterfall approach. And this is why when you look at the artifacts of theory, you put it on this circle or the ellipse here, there's no beginning, there's no end. It's very iterative, just like design thinking and um, design building um, for systems. Good science, good theory similarly follows this kind of thing. There's not a beginning or end and the pieces can iterate and build on each other. So this is purposeful because there's not a particular order necessarily to good science, to interesting breakthroughs. So as we close, consider the power of stories, the power of storytelling. And this has been seen every civilization, every culture, the storyteller has been central. And this is how information was conveyed and ideas and how memories were passed on and history and how culture evolved, whether uh, regardless of the background, stories have been key to this. And one of the key reasons why is people don't just think and speak in terms of stories, metaphors, analogies, but our cognition is story oriented. So we know that in our cognition, memories are stored in story-like schemas and we retrieve and we reconstruct memory. And so it turns out this is why metaphors and analogies and myths and so forth are so powerful because they connect into these story-based schemas, which our cognition uses for storage. Okay, on that note, that is the end of the story for part two of this series. Now, I'm going to continue this series in a few days by releasing part three, where I go back through the various artifacts of theory in particular examples. And I'm gonna use gamification, interdisciplinary research, as an example to show you various kinds of artifacts that can be applied for theory generation in that area. Until then, I hope this has been helpful to you. Please send me feedback and suggestions on future content. Appreciate your time and take care. Mm -hmm.